Hi, and welcome to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund. And today, we have a very special episode, and we want to present to you the experience of two women, Esther Kalischer and Lynn Rosenberg, as they discuss how they navigate the special challenges and explore the unique opportunities as women believers in the epicenter. They also share their unique perspective about isolation, making Aliyah, and their everyday experiences in the epicenter. I want to talk to Lynn and to Esther and let you hear their hearts. Uh, Both of them are living in Israel. I do not live in Israel, so we'll be focusing on their lives. They have a lot in common, like you heard. They're both stay-at-home moms. They both have four children, and they both support their husbands who are in full-time ministry. There are a lot of stresses that come with living in Israel. Um, We could talk about all kinds of stresses that they have there in the culture the stress of having children in the military, the stress of the financial burden of living in Israel, the time crunch of uh, working six days a week. But I'd like to focus on a particular pressure that uh, Israeli women face, which is isolation. Um, And I'm hoping that through talking to them, you'll hear their heart and that the Holy Spirit will put on your heart uh, at least one way in which you could lift them up in prayer as you think of them after this trip. And you may have questions that are brought out by what they're talking about, how they're sharing their lives, and I invite you to meet with them or talk to them, just catch them at a meal, and um, you can ask them more questions about themselves. So first, there are a lot of similarities between the two of you, but there are also some differences. One is that Esther, you were born and raised in Israel, and Lynn, you chose to move to Israel. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about those uh, differences, but maybe there are some similar experiences of isolation that go along with um, both of your experiences. So Esther, um, if you could first tell us uh, what it was like growing up in Beersheba, where you were born in Jerusalem, right? And then moved to Beersheba quickly. And so just tell us what it was like there, what it was like to be a believer, a believing family, uh, Jews who believe in Jesus. Okay, I was born in Jerusalem and soon mm-hmm. afterwards my parents moved to Beersheba, mm-hmm. which is a, used to be a small town in the south of Israel. We were probably the only family in Beersheba that were believers, for sure in our neighborhood mm-hmm. and for sure in our school, we were the only believers at school. So we felt somewhat isolated. Mm-hmm. Also our church, uh, our congregation was very small. We, had, we were the only family of chil- with children from mm-hmm. Beersheba itself. And we had two more families coming from another town. They had a few older children and one family from a village close to um, Beersheba. That was our congregation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up with no pastor and elders we had were appointed only years later. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them was my father. It was small, but it was serious and we were very, it was very important for our parents to teach us the values to teach us the faith, the principles of how to live right Mm. for the Lord even when we were isolated. Mm. Yeah, so that was also, today it's a bit different. Mm. Uh, Our daughters experience a different uh, life altogether. Mm. Uh, Of course we don't live in an isolated area right now, Mm -hmm. but uh, we're living in a kibbutz, messianic believing kibbutz, all the families are believers and the kids go to school together. It's not a Christian school, it's a public school, but there are lots of kids in in one class that are believers. Mm -hmm. Our young daughter goes uh, to, and she's in her sixth grade now with Mm -hmm. another six kids that are believers from our same neighborhood. And they feel very open and free to talk about their faith to their friends, Mm -hmm. to their teachers. They even witness to one of the teacher's assistants, uh, which was interesting. Mm Gili is a unique little girl. She's a, there's a big gap between her and our mm-hmm. youngest uh, daughter, almost 10 years gap. And she grew up basically with uh, older sisters. So she's mature for her age. Mm-hmm. She's, she's not the regular 11 year old girl. And one of the passages that really affected her and that she really liked that she took into heart is from James about the tongue. Mm-hmm. And one morning she was, uh, they have reading in the class 
everybody brings their book and they mm. open up their books to encourage the kids to read books. Mm. So she didn't, she just had finished her recent book, so she opened up her Bible and she looked at this passage from James chapter 4, I think, or 3. Anyway, she was sitting and reading this and writing all kinds of things, all, taking notes, and her teacher saw that she's not reading a book, so she approached her and she said, Gili, I see that you're not reading a book, what are you doing? And Gili started telling her about the tongue and, mm. you know, how the tongue can affect uh, speaking bad words, can hurt people, mm. and gossiping. And she started explaining the whole passage to her. And the teacher would, sat there amazed and asked questions. And two months later, I think, at a parent-teacher meeting, her teacher sat with me and she said, I have to tell you this, you know, mm. one day I, Gili was sitting in class and she was, instead of reading, she was writing and I approached her and I asked her, Gili, what are you doing? And she said, um, well, I'm reading this passage. I'm also trying to learn it by heart, all these verses. I mm. want to really learn this by heart. And I'm writing all kinds of things to help me. And the teacher was so impressed by what she had to say and, and everything. And, she's, and she asked her in front of me, Gili, would you be willing to share with the rest of the class what you mm. talk to me? So these are the kind of opportunities that our children are facing. Mm. Now, it's not all over Israel. Right. It's the same. I have to say, there are some kids that still grow up in cities and they, they feel very isolated. Mm -hmm. But some other cities where there's more uh, believers living together, they can experience these kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, our daughters in high school, for instance, uh, they, they were eight or nine students in high school and they decided to have a prayer meeting once a week. Mm. So even though school began very early, they decided they'll wake up even earlier and come to school 45 minutes before, mm. share with each other and pray together. Mm. For us, it's a dream, yes. <laughs> you yes. know, thinking that these things can happen today in a society that's uh, sometimes hostile, but not always. I mean, they're more accepting now than they were in our days. Right. But to see this happening right now is a real blessing. Right. The things for us uh, as kids that really encouraged us a lot and helped mm -hmm. us to keep on going was the one week in summer that we had a camp and we mm -hmm. met other believers from all over the country mm -hmm. that come together and we saw that we're not the only ones in Israel with mm -hmm. the faith in Jesus, but there are others that also believe like us, struggle like, like us, feel isolated like us. But this week was just so fulfilling in so many ways, not only studying together and singing these wonderful songs, but the fellowship and the relationships that developed from there. And if, if I can say that when I was growing up, uh, our youth camp had 30 kids. Nowadays, youth camps have 300. I mean, that for us is, is a lot. I know for Probably for you guys, it doesn't sound that much, but for us, it's, it's seeing a growth in the body of Christ in Israel. Yeah, I don't know if you're understanding exactly what um, she means, but when she talks about a youth camp, she means a national youth camp. So this is a youth camp for every believing child in the entire nation because they don't have youth group, right, when they are the only children at a congregation. So they have national youth camps not national in the sense of that it's sponsored by the nation, but it, it uh, draws kids from all over the nation. And so when um, Esther was young, there would be 30 kids from the entire nation coming together to fellowship. And they felt like, this is amazing. We've never been in a room with 30 other believers. Uh, today, like she said, youth camps can draw 300, what does um, Walk on Water draw? four or five hundred some and there are different camps that are uh, different streams of um, uh, churches or denominations will have different camps so today this is like explosive growth and encouragement for the the body of Yeshua so the Joshua Fund supports a lot of youth camps and I think they're a very important part of the kids uh, feeling like they have fellowship and encouragement because like she said in some towns and cities these kids really are the only believer in their schools and I think that's something that none of us can really identify with I mean maybe there's one or two of you maybe who have experienced something like that but for us we're thinking you know we come from a town where there are 300 churches 
And it's a small town, Lynchburg, Virginia, so 300 churches to choose from. But when you are the only children in a congregation, there's no pastor. I mean, if you disagree with someone, where are you going to go? There's no other place to go. You know, So you have to learn to get along, how to fellowship with one another, or you will be completely isolated. So, so yeah. Um, Lynn, can you tell us a little bit about making Aliyah, the challenges of that, what Aliyah means, and just some of the isolation that you can experience through that, or the ups and downs, challenges? Sure. Well, we uh, Aliyah means going up, and it's the Hebrew term for immigrating to Israel, because when you think of going to Jerusalem, you're always going up. Jerusalem is in the hills, but spiritually speaking, it's, you know, the highest up. So whenever you're going to return to the land, as a Jewish person going back to Israel, it's making Aliyah or going up. So uh, of course, as you know, Joel um, is a Jewish believer. And so based on his grandparents' faith as Jews all their lives, Orthodox Jews in Brooklyn, we had the right to go and to get citizenship in Israel. Not something we always thought we were going to do, but um, something the Lord put on both of our hearts in a very strong way, even separately from each other. We always felt we should be involved in Israel, that we should be serving there, going there, teaching about it, but we weren't sure that we were really gonna be citizens. It's one thing to go on a tour to Israel, which we love. We especially love bringing tours to Israel. I always say bringing people to Israel for the first time is like uh, showing someone your favorite movie, like times a thousand, <laughs> because you just know it's so exciting to watch them see everything for the first time. But that's very different from, then we started doing ministry trips there. We would go for two weeks or three weeks and serve in different places, do VBS or whatever. We loved that. And our children grew up going to Israel and really loving Israel. And we encouraged them as we began to pray about moving there to be part of the decision. They were uh, 19, 17, 15, and uh, 9 or 10, I guess, about. Generally, I'm not good with numbers, but that's about right. Uh, when we were moving. So it wasn't like their lives would just be, like we just said, come on, we're all just going. We needed them to think seriously about counting the cost. Our oldest son had finished two years at Biola University in L.A., and our next son had just graduated from high school and had been accepted to Moody Bible Institute. He was excited to go there. Our 15-year-old Jonah was playing competitive soccer and on a route to getting a full scholarship to play soccer. So it was a huge disruption for their lives. So we didn't want to just say, hey, guys, guess what? We're leaving. <laughs> We're moving to Israel. So we all prayed about it, talked about it, thought about it. And they all were on board until about two weeks after we got there. <laughs> and then they said, this is a big mistake. <laughs> Our verse of the day today is Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And our prayer requests today are to pray for Christian women in the epicenter, that they are strengthened and encouraged for Jesus every day and act as supports for their families. And also, second, Pray for women in the Middle East and the epicenter yet to know Jesus, that the light of the glorious gospel will shine in their hearts. Yeah, it was a very rough transition. You know, we learned about a year or so after moving there, we learned that there had been a policy since the 40s or something, or maybe I don't know how long, for 100 years, in the Southern Baptist that missionaries were never allowed to go to the field with teenagers. You could go to the field with young children, or you could go as empty nesters or with no children, but not with teenagers. And they changed that recently when David Platt took over that job um, but and made a, diff a sort of different. But anyway, we thought, there is wisdom in that. <laughs> it makes sense why Abraham and Sarah came without kids, you know, to the land. It's not easy to navigate the teen years anywhere in the world, but when kids are discovering their identities, um, but to come and change your whole culture and your whole country in those teen years was very difficult, very, very difficult. But thank God we've been weathering the storm. You know, we told them, I remember Joel took the boys out for breakfast and he said, you know, if we move to Israel, you'll be required to serve in the military. Joel said, I'm flat footed and 40 something and they're not gonna have me serve in the military, but you guys are going to have to serve in the military. What do you think about that? And I remember Jacob saying, um, or Jacob said, it sounds epic. You know, because these boys grew up on Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and battles and swords and everything. 
And we reminded him of that <laughs> after he started the army and hit the wall of great discouragement and isolation, um, just in the same way that children in, in Esther's generation were often the only believers in their town. Still today, in most of the army units, children are the only believers in their entire unit or on their entire base. That was certainly the case with Jacob and Jonah, our two middle sons who've both been serving and served. They didn't have any other believers um, there at all. So those kind of camps and gatherings on the weekends are just like air to breathe. They really are um, so necessary for them to be together. So like Esther said, it's been amazing for them to have that, that kind of support. And also our congregation. We go to a congregation in Jerusalem that is um, actually pastored by Victor's brother, <laughs> Menno, who is hilarious and a wonderful teacher. And um, they have such an amazing uh, love for the soldiers. You know, in the hallway, there's a poster which has the pictures of all the guys and the amount of support and prayer and gifts and notes. The congregation really comes around the soldiers and makes them know they're not alone. They're being prayed for. So the young adult ministry at the church has been such a lifesaver also for my guys. So but it's not easy also to um, kind of insert yourself into, if you think about what Esther described, of 30 kids that were growing up together in a whole country. It's about the size of New Jersey, if you remember. 30 believers that would all come together. Those kids loved each other and stuck together. They are tight. They're a tight group. And even today, even though there's more of them, still 300 in a whole country, in their towns and in their areas, it's a tight group which they have to be. They have to stick with each other, support each other, keep each other accountable. So when you come in as the new guy, this is not easy. And you it's understandable because they need each other. They're only together for a brief time occasionally, maybe on a weekend, maybe every few months at a conference. So they need each other. So that's also been really challenging for them to find their way. Where do, where do I belong? Am I American? Am I Israeli? Am I both? The, lang I the language difference. Yeah. The lang of course, at the beginning, they didn't speak um, the language. So, you know, you can imagine as a teenager showing up at a youth conference and sitting there and just not even being able to do the jokes. Jonah was in the, is in a special forces unit, and he said the worst part of his day was in the evening when everyone would get in their bunks in the room, and they would just finally have a short time to just sort of let loose and be relaxed. And they would all be just singing funny songs they'd grown up with and telling inside jokes that they understood from, you know, growing up in Israel. And he had no idea what they're talking about. He understood the words by now. He's fluent. Both of my middle boys are amazing, by God's grace, really fluent in the language. But, but they just had, he had no idea. He couldn't enter into that sort of, you know, the joy and the relaxation with the guys. He much preferred when they were doing the drills you know, and they were all working together on, you know, learning something because then he could just be one of the guys. But when things just got relaxing, you know, he doesn't understand the jokes and it's very hard to enter in. So, yeah, it's um, lots of prayer. <laughs> lots of challenges. Yeah. <laughs> How would you say that um, just the, the reality of being isolated has grown you in your walk with the Lord? There's not too much you can do about it besides turn to God and your family mm -hmm. and your closest mm -hmm. uh, friends. And that's what we used to do. We just, we stuck together and mm -hmm. I have a really good friend. She's like a sister to me today. I won't say she's my mentor because we're more or less the same age, but definitely she's seen me through challenges mm -hmm. and I could say the same about her. And there was always strengthening each other yeah. uh, in the word and prayer and support and keeping in touch. And um, I have to say about my daughters in the yeah. army, I yeah. want to just, yeah. if I can go back to that. Definitely. One of our daughters just recently, for a long, she's still in the army, five years in the army. And just recently, I noticed that she hasn't been calling me so much. Mm. And when she came home, I asked her, listen, you're not calling me something, are, are, is everything yeah. okay? Yeah. Or uh, are you going through challenges? Maybe you're going through stuff. Are you talking to somebody else? And she said, mom, you know, I don't want to just call you every time there's a challenge or there's something hard that's going on with me. 
I want to learn to give it to God. Mm. So you're not hearing from me because I'm turning to God and I'm, I want to mm. learn to rely on him. And for me, you know, I thought maybe she's talking to somebody else. I was kind of offended. She's yeah. not sharing yeah. things with me. <laughs> but no, she's yeah. learning how to rely on God mm. and her isolation and her challenges and uh, different things that she's going through. So I have to say, you know, I, on one hand, you know, I, I miss our yeah. talks. She does talk to me when she comes home, of course, but yeah. on the other hand, I see how God is working His way through them. Mm. And, and that's the best. That's yeah. the best and the most the important thing yeah. for us as parents to see. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. How about you, Lynn? Thank you, Esther. I think for me, uh, it's learning to trust the Lord with my children. Mm -hmm. I think um, as a homeschool mom in America, I homeschooled all the boys, and we were part of a very vibrant community mm -hmm. of homeschooling families. And it, was, it felt very cozy and safe <laughs> and understandable. And um, I thought that I had a very strong faith until mm -hmm. I moved to Israel. <laughs> and then I, you know, like Joel described, the shaking that happened. And I realized I, I can't make things right for my children all the time. I just, it's actually out of my control. I think I was living under the lie mm -hmm. that my children's happiness depended on me, mm -hmm. on making the right food and making the house cozy and having traditions and reading books and having chocolate chip cookies and that would make <laughs> life all good. And it did work for a long time. <laughs> but um, then we hit this change in our, um, in our lives and I realized I can't make them happy. All those things weren't working anymore. And I realized too often I pray for circumstances around their lives and not for their hearts and their character. Yeah. I took a really interesting course called Praying with Paul recently in a, a class I took. And it was such a, I don't know why I never thought that I spent too much time praying for, Lord, give them good friends and give them a good teacher that likes them and help them succeed and all the external things, which it's not wrong to pray for those things, but I spent way too little time praying Lord, capture their heart for you. Lord, teach them to walk in the Holy Spirit. Lord, teach them to be empathetic to others. Like praying for their character mm -hmm. and praying the way Paul prayed for his disciples. You mm -hmm. don't see him praying, take them out of persecution right. so much or make everything great for them or make everything easy for them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was the biggest thing for me. Okay, I want to shift just a little bit. We have a, just a few minutes left and I want you to talk to us about a new program. The body is growing in Israel, which is very exciting, but it's still a very young body, you know, in comparison to America or uh, other cultures that have had a long history of um, churches and um, fellowship in Israel since it's been reborn. And so um, the church is, uh, or the body of Christ is, is fairly young. And so there are still some maybe holes. At first there wasn't youth groups. Now there still is some things that need to grow, and one of those areas is women's ministry. And so, Lynn and Esther, if you could talk a bit about the program, Lynn, that you've developed with the uh, Bible College for Women's Studies. And Esther is going to be attending that, too. So, As though I could teach Esther. <laughs> it's very humbling. We're going to be learning together. We're going to be studying God's Word together. Yeah. Do you want to start or me? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll tell a little bit about it. So there's a, I think we've already mentioned the Israel College of the Bible that's in Israel, um, in Netanya. Yeah, it's in Israel. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> it's the, and uh, it's very cleverly named. It's in Netanya, in the center of the country, sort of near Tel Aviv. And um, there has been, over the last five or six years, a wonderful program for pastors to get more theological training and to come together to strengthen their, their knowledge of how to teach the word and how to unpack the scripture, how to disciple and practical ministry things. Um, and about 44 men have gone through that program. And in those years, they would say, now we want something for our wives. What about our wives? One thing you might not know about congregations in Israel, sometimes there's a pastor that is a full-time dedicated pastor to the congregation, but that's not uh, always the normal case. A lot of the pastors have to have an outside job because right. the congregations are very small and so they can't support a pastor. Mm -hmm. So you might have a pastor who can fully give his attention to the congregation or you might have several elders who are sharing the role, who are taking turns teaching and who are um, taking turns trying to shepherd the group. 
Then there are some congregations that have full-time pastors, but very rarely is there any other staff, like even a secretary or a, um, definitely not a women's ministry director or a children's director or a youth leader or a worship leader. I mean, if you think of your church staffs, it's just not like that. Everything is volunteers for the most part. So a lot of the women who are the wives of pastors are supporting their husbands. Sometimes they have jobs, mm -hmm. raising their children, in charge of sometimes being a kind of a secretary for their husband, doing children's ministry, doing women's ministry. It's very exhausting for these women. And the husbands and the wives are like, we would love to have something for us to equip us, encourage us, mm -hmm. teach us practical ministry skills. So. Four years ago, uh, my friend Cece and I started praying. She's um, the women's director at the college, working with women students, but there was nothing sp specific for women's ministry. So she and I started meeting to pray and plan and ask the Lord, could he help us to develop something to offer the women of Israel? Um, and so this November, we're launching our first ever program to train women in women's ministry in the country that's ever existed. So and exciting. So it's very, we're very, very excited. I think there's some pictures. Mm -hmm. We just had an orientation day for the ladies. So there they are. There's 20 women. So the woman in the front with the tan pants next to me is Cece. Mm -hmm. She's the director of the program, and then I'm the associate director. Half of those women come from a Messianic Jewish background, and half are Arab Christian women. Mm -hmm. We are half and half. Mm -hmm. So sweet. What a mm -hmm. picture of the unity we have in the Lord Jesus. So we spend mm -hmm. time praying together and getting to know each other at this orientation day, just, uh, just right before I came on the cruise. So we're so excited. We really would ask for your prayers, mm -hmm. that God would help us overcome the language differences. We've got Arabic, English, and Hebrew speakers, and Russian speakers. And so um, there's a lot that could divide us, but in Jesus uh, is stronger to unite us. So we need your prayers. So and Esther, are you excited to join the ladies? Excited. Yeah, I've been waiting for this program for a long time. Thank you for joining us today in this special episode of Inside the Epicenter podcast to understand and explore the unique challenges that women who believe in Jesus in the epicenter face every day. If you found this podcast really valuable, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Do you want to talk about something else on this show? Do you have a question that you'd like Joel to answer? Go to joshuafund.com and click on Contact Us. Your feedback is incredibly valuable to us as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on this podcast that you'd like more information on. For Joel Rosenberg and the entire Joshua Fund ministry team, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg, founder and chairman of the Joshua Fund, and I've got exciting news. In 2023, I'm inviting you, on behalf of our entire board and staff, to come to the Holy Land, to come to Israel on the next Prayer and Vision Tour. This is the 75th anniversary of the prophetic rebirth of the modern state of Israel back in 1948. And what is God doing here? It's amazing, spiritually, economically, in so many ways, there's been so much growth, so much progress, but the best is yet to come. And we want you to see it. We want you to walk where Jesus walked. We want you to see where the apostles ministered. We want you to see where people's lives were transformed by the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We want you to see this city where Jesus died and rose again and where he's coming back, I hope soon. But in the meantime, come to Israel with the Joshua Fund. You can learn more about the trip, the itinerary, the cost, all the details at joshuafund.com. But sign up quickly because I think this thing is going to fill up fast. The Prayer and Vision Tour of Israel in the fall of 2023. I hope to see you there.